So, um, has anybody ever heard a politician talk as they're running for election, promising great things, and then when they get elected, they do the exact opposite? Maybe, maybe this is kind of strange, right? No, no, it never happened before. <laughs> this is, you know, and sometimes, you know, I think to myself, uh, you know, I, I hope none of the candidates I supported won because that means I probably voted for the wrong guy. Um, you know, s sometimes we get that uh, that attitude because of how you know you get kind of jaded when you're in this for a long time because you know you just you get a lot of globalists in there in office, and so it's important for us, of course, to to do what is right, whether we whatever the outcome is, you have to do what's right because you're accountable to God, not to the and let Him leave the results to Him. And so what we need to do also is understand what we can do. We don't have to wait for elections to be free. We can be free right now. And one of those, and, and so I want to talk about the importance of the things the founding fathers talked about because they did not say, oh, dang it, you know, King George, he's not very good. So let's just, maybe his kid will be good, right? We're going to wait for, we're going to, we're going to wait for the next guy and then maybe we'll be free then because we will, maybe then we'll have a, the, a good leader. And so there are things that they talked about that they said we need to support and things that they needed to do to be free right then and now and that we need to remember again. So I want to talk about natural law. We talk about, it's mentioned a lot in the uh, Declaration of Independence. It's referred to in, in several different ways. We see, we see it in the Declaration of Independence to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Nature's God. Okay, so natural law, laws of nature, nature's God. This is natural law that they refer to. We see in other places. So we ask the question, what is natural law? Sometimes people ask me, so when we talk about natural law, where is it, where is it written, right? Is it written down? Who decided it, right? Because when we think of laws, laws often are, are passed by legislatures. So who voted on these natural laws? Is sometimes asked of me, and I'm like, it's pretty clear you're not exactly understanding what natural law is, if that's what we're expecting. Just kind of picture this ball right here, and we throw it up in the air, what's going to happen? It's going to fall down, right? And uh, how do you know that? Gravity, okay. You've experienced though, right? That's something you've seen before. Gravity. So what if we all got together in this room? We said within the boundaries of this room, we're going to vote and we're going to say this balls, you know, it's illegal now. Balls cannot fall if we throw them up in the air. Is that going to change what happens when you throw the ball up in the air? No. It's irrelevant. What we decide on natural laws are irrelevant to what we decide or not. In fact, in the 1800s, the state of Ohio uh, legislature passed a law changing the definition of pie and uh, of a circle. They wanted to, and of course, you know, things that doesn't work very well. And so they had to, they, they realized you can't change uh, immutable laws. So a natural law is something that's unchangeable, right? We can see the wheel throughout time. Of course, technology changes. You might have a smoother ride, but the idea is the same. It's gonna, a, a wheel is gonna roll. A ball is gonna fall basically no matter when and no matter what under the, under equal circumstances. So we look through the Declaration of Independence talking about some of these natural laws. And it talks about that they, these truths are self evident. Right? I'm not going to argue with you about the color of the blue sky. If, if you're going to argue about that, then you're just, there's just something, there's nothing we can talk about, right? And so these are things that were just self-evident. Any reasonable person is going to agree with these things that we are, all men are created equal and that they are empowered and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That they're, to, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. So government's job is to protect our God-given rights. Those are some key things to understand. We go through, it's obvious, no matter what other people say, that we get our rights from God. That is essential, because if we believe on the contrary that our rights come from government, that means that government can take them away or grant them to us at their whims. Well, we understand that God gives us our rights, and if that is the case, then no one 
can take them away legitimately. Some of those rights, of course, are life, liberty, and happiness, property. And the government was created by the people not to give them their rights, but to protect them, protect their rights. And that's very important to understand, right? We look at the First Amendment, the, the, the Tenth Amendment, the, the, the Ten Amendments, the Bill of Rights, they all start off with government shall not, right? It's, it's, a, it's like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. We are, the government is prohibited from violating these rights, from violating these things. And that, go, that the people, right? What are the first three words of the Constitution? We the people. We delegated certain authority to them. We gave them that authority. That means if government is doing something that I can't do, then it is acting illegitimately. I can't give them an authority that I myself don't have. So if I see them doing something, then um, they're doing it illegitimately. So if government gets beyond protecting our life, liberty, and property, then they are now illegitimate. And the people, it is our job, it is our duty, according to the Founding Fathers, to either alter that government or to abolish it, as they did with, with, the, uh, with, with England. And that is what we see throughout time, of the, from the pilgrims to ancient Israel to the Founding Fathers. Sometimes you have to separate that. And where do they learn these principles? There is um, a lot of natural law thinkers uh, during the, the 16 and 1700s that the Founding Fathers looked to beyond others, the, the scriptures. Uh, but we have here this man with a funny name and funny hair, Samuel Pufendorf. And he was a natural law philosopher in Germany in the 1600s. He was an expert on law and uh, his historian. And he was most famous for his writings on natural law. And his writings on uh, were the cultural foundations for the movement that the, that the colonists uh, pushed for independence. He was a traditional Christian in dogma and doctrine. And he was quoted by the founding fathers a lot. And it's unfortunate that those that even in those that consider themselves, you know, patriotic and constitutionalists don't know about Samuel Pufendorf. His writings were very essential. And he, he wrote some, some clear principles here. He says they do not, that they do this, they, they come together for government to form safeguards against the depravity of mankind. Okay? We understand that we are corrupt individuals and so that we need to protect our God-given rights from those that would take them away. And to avoid the da- that danger, agreeable men join forces by interweaving their interests and safety, forming confederacies for their natural safety and support. To achieve this purpose, those who seek it should be firmly joined together. That's why we form government. But why do they dissolve? Why do we sometimes have to have a declaration of independence? It says, among those which join together to form a government in a country, it is absolutely requisite that there be a perfect consent and agreement concerning the use of the means of government, right? It is like fire. You don't want to just give the power of government to to anyone. If they do not agree with themselves, but are divided and separated in their opinions, they will be divided into parties and will clash. In the United States today, are we united on the principles of government? No. And so just like Samuel Pufendorf, he know, he, this was a natural lie. He says, just like the ball being thrown up in the air, if we violate this principle, we, are cla- we will clash. And do we see that clash in politics today? Yes. It is observable. But of course, we don't want to just get rid of government willy-nilly. Or, oh, I don't like that guy's tie, right? Uh, governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. <clears throat> and accordingly, all experience have shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms of which they are accustomed. Sometimes you just put up with stuff because it's, it's better to suffer that than to just kind of overdo, you know, the, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't sometimes. But when a tr- long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design, it's on purpose, it's not an accident, to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. So, real quick, I want to go through what evils were insufferable. What are some of the things that the founding fathers said we could just we just can't put up with these things anymore? So we have that that great breakup letter with the with England saying we don't want to be together anymore, 
And these are some of those key points that they brought out. He says that the king has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. New offices sent around harassing the people. That wouldn't happen in America today, right? 345 federal agencies given quite, you know, assumed authority to be able to harass the people. And we see this happening. We have the Fed stinging those dangerous Amish people with their raw milk. We've got to stop those, those dangerous Amish. And we have OSHA fining American businessmen simply because they didn't force you to put a face diaper on during the fake pandemic. Then we have, he has affected, the king has affected to render the military independent and superior of the civil power. The king was just sending the military out on his own whims. That would never happen in America. Biden sends a thousand troops to Afghanistan, all on his own authority. Biden is boosting U.S. troops in Europe, Korea, Vietnam. Every war since World War II has been under the direction of the executive branch. Then we have, the king has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Pretend. They're playing house. When they go beyond their, their job of protecting life, liberty, and property, everything that they do is pretend. It's make-believe. The founding fathers treated it as such. So that's a le- any legislation that is beyond its delegated powers is pretend. And so we, we have these, uh, these, these jurisdictions foreign to our Constitution. And do we have this today? Well, yeah. We have over 80 international bodies that pretend to have authority over the American people and pass regulations on us and stop us from doing, or attempt to stop us from doing what uh, the God has given us the uh, authority to do. Then also the king has uh, transported us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. So we broke a pretend law, and so he's like, well, you know, your jury of your peers isn't going to convict you, and so we've got to get rid of you. And so we have dark prisons. We have many uh, U.S. citizens being held without uh, due process in Guantanamo Bay. We have dark prisons all over the United States holding people without uh, warrant and uh, without due process. The king has excited domestic insurrections amongst us. Man, just think of 2020. Uh, here in Utah, I did a report where I actually documented with video evidence this very thing where the p- local police department in Salt Lake City delivered a police car to the rioters to have them turn over and burn. And then the rioters at the Capitol, they were pro- actually, we documented, we videotaped uh, the, the state police protecting uh, agent provocateurs, agent, you know, government agents that were the ones instigating a lot of the the uh, insurrections, the real insurrections. I always think of uh, January 6th as the worst insurrection ever because, you know, it's not an insurrection. But, um, you know, when we think about these things, but, but what about Romans 13, which tells us that all authority comes from God and that people uh, you know, tell us that it says that we should just do whatever the government says because it comes from God. Well, the founding fathers were Christians. Most, many of them were pastors themselves. Um, here's a a former attorney general, Jeff Sessions, and uh, he talks about this, actually. I would cite you to the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise command in Romans uh, 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained the government for his purposes. And we as Christian citizens submit to the governmental authority. We submit ourselves, and refusal to submit constitutes resisting the authority of God. Romans 13 is the text that we are looking at under this heading of the Christian and government. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. That is an unqualified statement. It doesn't qualify who those governing authorities are, and it doesn't qualify what subjection might mean. Therefore, we can conclude that we have an unqualified, unmitigated command to be subjected to the governing authorities, whatever they are. 
It really wasn't consequential whether the Roman emperor was elected by the people, appointed by the Senate, or placed there by a military coup. It was not consequential whether the assertion of imperial authority by Caesar was just or unjust. It really wasn't essential whether the Caesar was a homosexual, a pedophile, a mother murderer, or a good man. The law is the same. There is no place for rebellion and resistance because to do so is to resist God. When I hear rhetoric like this that implies the state can't be trusted either, I'm sorry. We have to plant our faith in the state of Utah. Is. Yes. And, and p the pure uh, patriotic and the highest form of patriotism and the highest form of being an American is to place our faith in state government. And for you to push, push against that and others is to suggest is to suggest a form of lawlessness and a, and, a, and a divorce from structure that is the most un-American thing there is. A patriotic and the highest form of patriotism and the highest form of being an American is to place our faith in state government. And for you to push, push against that and others is to suggest, is to suggest a form of lawlessness and a, and, a, and a divorce from structure that is the most un-American thing there is. Put faith in government, right? That's not an idol. No, no. Idol worship. This, the, the idea that, you know, we are just to submit ourselves. It doesn't matter if he's a mother murderer. If he was put, if he's a tyrant. The idea that we are supposed to, that would mean that the founding fathers were anti-Christ at some point or another. But no, I believe in Thomas Jefferson's comment that rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. So why did the founders rebel if they believed the Bible? I would say that's why they rebelled. But um, we, we, some, some common readings and commentaries of the time, we have Cato's letters. If you haven't read those, I can't uh, encourage you to get them more. Uh, we have also a hind let loose, and we have what I have over at my table, killing no murder. These were all heavily read and influenced the founding fathers using the scriptures, all, all three of these, were heavily utilizing the Bible to justify what they were doing and to explain why it was okay for them to resist, right? Can you imagine this idea? You have Moses' mom. It's like, it's, it's the law. I have, to, I have to kill my baby. I, I, you know, I don't want to break the law. That would be rebellion against God. Or Moses, where he rebelled against Pharaoh. Was, was Moses rebelling against God because he didn't submit to the government authority? It's just it's obscene, frankly. And these pamphlets were, were fantastic tools to help the people understand these principles so they could overcome the hundreds of years of propaganda to get them to try to obey a tyrant. And so in the book, Killing No Murder, we ask, the question is asked, what is a tyrant? Because today, kind of like with natural law, people just throw the term out, like Nazi, right? It just doesn't, it doesn't matter if it means something. We can have it mean whatever it wants. The words have no meaning anymore. We don't even know what a woman is anymore. But, but, but words have meaning. They do. And tyrant is not an obscure and ambiguous word. It's a word with a meaning, and this book answers it. There are two kinds of tyrants. The first kind is, I won't try to pronounce the Latin, but the English translation is no right to govern. They don't have the right to govern. And the other one is that they govern tyrannically. And so we need to identify, and, and the book Killing No Murder identifies those two things. So do they have the right to govern? Um, it says, by the laws of God and nature, the care, defense, and support of the family lies upon every man whose it is. By laws of God, it's our job as a man to defend our families. But several families uniting themselves together to make up one body of a commonwealth and being independent one of another without any natural superiority or obligation, nothing can introduce amongst them a disparity of rule and, subject, and subjection, but some power that is over them, which power none can pretend to have but God and themselves. 
Wherefore, all power which is lawfully exercised over such a society of men, which from the end of its institution we call a commonwealth, must necessarily be de um, derived either from the appointment of God Almighty, who is the supreme Lord of all and every part, or from the consent of that society itself. So like either your, your leader is appointed by God like Moses, or because you elected him, you chose him. Now, with all of what we can see going on right now, the latter is not very common. We have a lot of election fraud, so are our leaders actually legitimate? Have they gotten, have they received our consent to be our rulers? And if not, what does that make them? If the ruler is not appointed by God, nor chosen by the people, these are some things that we can identify if he rules tyrannically. He's not a ruler, but he's an invader. And those that are subject to that power are not governed, but they are oppressed. Okay, we some key principles the book lays out on how to identify if they govern tyrannically. They pretend to defend liberty. They talk about the Constitution. They talk about the Founding Fathers. And then they go and vote, like our state legislature in the state of Utah, to bring the United to fund a United Nations event here in the state of Utah. Or to turn us over to a regional government. Uh, rule by fraud more than force, using cunning plausible pretenses to impose upon men's understandings, and in the end, they master those that had so little wit as to rely upon their faith and integrity. <coughs> so they basically, they trick you into believing it's, it's legitimate. They slowly rid the ranks of government and our military of moral men, and they are slowly replaced. Do, do, is our government uh, full of moral men? Uh, they impoverish the people to make it more difficult to oppose them with taxes, inflation, excises, etc. Do we have that today? Make war to distract and make people busy. Get their money. Create new taxes. That, I'm sure glad that doesn't happen today. <laughs> Don't want the people gathering, even in small groups. Don't want people building relationships. They divide us. They keep us separate. Remember a couple of years ago, they said you couldn't get together with 10 or more people. When the, the governor of Utah said that you were not allowed to gather with 10 or more, we held a picnic on the steps of the state capitol with about 20 people that were not yet scared to leave their houses. We went right to their front door to tell them we are not going to obey your tyranny. Those of influence in religion will make the people believe the government is good. Like those pastors that we saw that said you had to obey a baby murderer. Get disposable people to do his dirty work so he can fire them and make the people happy. Nothing actually changes. So they, you know, put the, they have a scapegoat where they, oh my goodness, thank goodness this came to my attention. That's Joe's fault. We're going to fire him and now everything is back to, to normal. We're all good now. And we also claim to be religious and God-fearing. Remember Bill Clinton would carry his Bible with him? You know, Can't think of a more God-fearing man than that, right? So, so are we living in a tyranny today, according to the definitions of those that were wiser than us? So here's the, the introductory response. These are kind of the first levels of what do you do about living under a tyranny. Thomas Jefferson, as we know, uh, really was the, the individual that wrote the most uh, uh, about the idea and the principle of nullification. He said the several states who formed that instrument, meaning the Constitution, being sovereign and independent, have the unquestionable right to judge of its infraction. Did he say the Supreme Court gets to judge its infraction? No. The states and the people. That a nullification by those sovereignties of all unauthorized acts done under color of that instrument is the rightful remedy. So it's just suing harder, you know, just taking the, you're going to, you have a guy rob, you have two guys rob your house together and you're going to go to one of the guys and you're going to say, hey, did your buddy, you know, did he, did he violate my property? That's exactly what it means when you take the, the government to court is you're asking these co-conspirators to protect you in your rights. That's not what the Founding Fathers said to do. Founding Fathers said to disobey. 
We have an example in 1832. There was a case brought against the state of Georgia in their elections. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled against Georgia. And so did Georgia just capitulate? I'm not going to bring it up if that's what they did. So no, they, the legislature got together and they nullified the Supreme Court. They actually said that if any federal official comes to the state of Georgia to enforce this ruling, they will be hung. Capital punishment to enforce the Constitution. Now we go to the 1840s, and uh, there was an individual in, uh, in Illinois. And there was a lot of government persecution a- a- against him. And he was under the, for his, for his religion, and he was under uh, arrest. He was the, the prisoner of a sheriff, and they were being, he was taking them back to, to prison. And they stopped in this town called Ottawa. And the sheriff of Lee County came to my assistance and slept by me. So assistance kind of like, it's being sarcastic. He's like, my, you know, my jailer is my assistant, right? And slept by me. And in the morning, certain men wished to see me, but I was not allowed to see them. The news of my arrival had steadily, had hastily circulated about the neighborhood. And very early in the morning, the largest room in the hotel was filled with citizens who were anxious to hear me preach and requested me to address them. So you got this prisoner but he's popular amongst the people. They gather together. They want to hear him talk. The sheriff responds. He says, Sheriff Reynolds, pointing to me, said, I wish you to understand this man is my prisoner, and I want you should disperse. You must not gather around here in this way. Upon which an aged gentleman, who was lame and carried a large hickory walking stick, advanced towards Reynolds, the sheriff, bringing his hickory upon the floor. So you got this old guy, can't walk too well got a cane, pounds the cane on the floor, and says to the sheriff, you damned infernal puke. (laughs) We'll learn you to come here and interrupt gentlemen. Can you imagine? Sit down there, pointing to the very low chair, and sit still and don't open your head till General Smith gets through talking. You cannot kidnap men here if you do in Missouri, and if you attempt it here, there's a committee in this grove that will sit on your case, and sir, it is the highest tribunal in the United States, as from its decision, there is no appeal. The culture understood nullification, the culture understood where authority came from, we the people, delegated authority, the ultimate authority is us because we're the ones that delegated it. And in fact, the sheriff did understand that. And his response, well, because the, the man was the head of the committee of safety who had prevented the settlers in the public domain from being imposed upon by land speculators, but sat down in silence while I addressed the assembly for an hour and a half. The people stood up to corrupt government, told them to sit down and shut up, and they did what God said that they were allowed to do. They had free speech, they were allowed to talk, get together. And so we need, to, we need to remember these examples and remember these principles again. We don't need to wait for King George's son to maybe be a good guy, right? You have ancient um, Egypt and Pharaoh the, was a friend of, of Israel, and then he died and his son was not a friend to Israel. You don't wait for a good king to do the right thing. Hey, that rhymes. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, this isn't meaning that we can just do whatever we want. This isn't license to just go down I-15 and start doing donuts, right? We've got to follow natural law. So we need to ask ourselves, is the government authorized to make this law? Is it in the Constitution or is it in the, of, of, of your state or of the union, right? Are they authorized? Did we delegate that authority? Are we allowed to delegate that authority? Ask ourselves that question. If I were to do the same thing that the government is doing, if I were to do that thing, would I get in trouble with the government? Does obeying this law violate my conscience? These are the things that we ask ourselves when we say, okay, is this the right time to nullify? Because you know what? Every, I'm sitting in a room of a bunch of felons. Because it's been shown that all of us commit on average three felonies each and every day. <laughs> so I say, you know what? If I'm already committing felonies, I might as well do it on purpose, right? I might as well pick pick the laws that I'm going to break because they're immoral. So I want to go back to Cato's letters. I quoted in the in, in our edition of Killing No Murder. Cato's letters says, "The law of nature does not only allow us 
but oblige us to defend ourselves. It is our duty, not only to ourselves, but to the society. If we suffer tamely a lawless attack upon our property and fortunes, we encourage it and involve others in our doom. As Cicero says, he who does not resist mischief when he may is guilty of the same crime as if he had deserted his parents, his friends, and his country. When men begin to be wicked, we cannot tell where that wickedness will end. We have reason to fear the worst and provide against it. So I encourage us all to be the worst global citizen we can be. Thank you.